guys, welcome to Lean to the Left. Today we're with Brandilyn Barnett, author of Dreams Deferred, Recession, Struggle, and the Quest for a Better World. His LinkedIn profile says he's an angel investor through Democratized Ventures, agent of change creating a world where philanthropy belongs to everyone, showing social impact can happen anywhere. Now, according to what I've read about you, Brandilyn, from 2008 through 2013, you were hit hard by the Great Recession, struggling to find work, even searching the streets of San Francisco, looking for a place to sleep. So, Brandilyn, let's talk about that. Today, you're involved with corporate philanthropy. What happened? Well, uh, in many ways, I met the right people, and I was fortunate. Um, to just be persistent and find the right environment where my passions for having an impact uh, could grow, despite the fact that I couldn't find the right jobs, oftentimes couldn't find, even when I did find a job, roles that paid enough for me to actually be able to live, let alone take care of my family uh, and those I loved. Uh, so I would say there's a lot of fortune that goes into that. I know a lot of others haven't been so fortunate, and that's why I'm committed to the work I do, uh, which I hope to drive change at scale uh, and move resources to people that need them. I do that through uh, helping to build and design new technologies, uh, whether that's in my role at Salesforce or as an entrepreneur. I do that by helping uh, other entrepreneurs who want to achieve their dreams and build income and wealth in their communities, uh, oftentimes through products that also uh, have an impact um, and are sustainable. Uh, and so I do that kind of work as an angel investor, but um, the question of what happened is a big is a big question. <laughs> yeah, so. it is. I'm sure. I mean, I mean, here you were practically on the streets, and now you're, you know, you're involved in philanthropy. I mean, wow. wow. Yes, and I think you know one of the things I had to realize in my journey is that we have a very limited idea of what philanthropy is, and so one of the reasons I wrote the book is so that I could begin to be a part of and help to lead conversations that change that. Because we have this idea that philanthropy is the providence of the Bill Gateses of the world. Yeah, uh, rich people. Yeah. The very wealthy, the very rich. And what ends up happening is, you know, and the reason I think that conversation is so important is, you know, I build products all the time. And when I build a product, when you build anything, you need to go and you need to learn from the stakeholders that that product or that initiative or that policy is going to affect. And you need to listen and you need to bring empathy to the process of building. Mm -hmm. and, and so what happens in the philanthropic space, however, is that because we've got this limited definition of philanthropy, uh, we've got big philanthropy that comes into communities in the United States and all over the world and says, hey, we're going to solve your problem. We're the Gates Foundation. We're going to solve your problem. We're the Ford Foundation. We're going to solve your problems. But so often people who live in the communities that are you know, experiencing those problems, those issues, they're not on the board, they're not part of the staff, uh, they're not the program officers determining where the grants go, um, they're not involved in that process. And nowhere else do we think it's okay to build something without, without understanding very deeply who that thing you're building is going to affect. And so one of the principles for me that I've been, you know, trying to promote with the book is just this idea that the world has changed and the way to have an impact on others and communities and in places where we live and the issues we care about, whether that's sustainability or the arts, goes now beyond traditional philanthropy. There are opportunities. It's easier than ever for ordinary people to give, to volunteer, to find ways to get involved in their local community, to build their own image and brand in a way that can help them if they want to seek local office and make a difference in that sense. It's easier than ever for us to rethink the very idea that impact only happens within the charitable space or the philanthropic space. When in fact now we have B Corps and other kinds of entities that are building more sustainable products that are building a vision for how companies can just treat their employees differently in a way that makes their lives better. And so the idea that I want to fight back against is this idea that philanthropy belongs to the, to the wealthy. You said it in the beginning, but it's kind of become, you know, my catchphrase. And it's something that's very powerful for me because I spent so long 
trying to be a part of this work and failing miserably, unable to get jobs, un unable to get anyone to listen to me at some of these big philanthropic institutions. And so now for me, impact is the work that I do in technology that helps to move hundreds of hours or thousands, depending upon the organizations that I'm working with, of pro bono volunteering expertise to charities and nonprofits uh, or other organizations that need them. It's investments in entrepreneurs who are then going to be able to create jobs and opportunities for others in their community. And how can I help them think about being more sustainable companies, treating their employees better because of my expertise that I've built over time in corporate responsibility. Um, and so the idea of philanthropy is something I want to change generally. Okay. Well, are you focused on helping Black entrepreneurs raise money, training them? Yes. So that is one of my focuses, and it's become a bigger, bigger passion over time. I write in the book about my, as you mentioned, my experiences in the 08 recession. And part of that for me was just realizing, you know, I'd always wanted to do work in charity and philanthropy. And part of it stemmed from the fact that I'm a giant nerd. I grew up loving Star Trek okay. and Babylon 5, admiring okay. Captain Picard and, and uh, those sorts of ideals. Um, but I, I saw those worlds that we, that we all love and aspire to. But then in my own personal life, I would see my mother crying because she couldn't pay the bills. Right. I would see a community that did, where no one even saw opportunities for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so people resorted to gang violence or other options because it's the only path that they saw. And so um, for me, I wanted to be part of work in charity and philanthropy coming out of undergrad, thinking about my future because I thought that that was a, a means to building a better world, uh, to building towards those, those worlds that I idealized as a kid. And what I realized during the course of my own journey was we've created an economic system where people need work, people need jobs. Um, you mentioned uh, my experience around 2008, 2010, wandering the streets of San Francisco, looking for a place to sleep, unable to find a job that, again, paid enough just for me to live, something that I know so many of your listeners uh, are probably familiar with. For me, it's just trans been a transformation over time uh, to realize also seeing my mother, who had worked her whole life, and then towards the end, um, really living in abject poverty. I, and me over here, recent college graduate, 26 years old, no money to my name, doing everything I can just to help her go to doctor's visits, navigate our ridiculously complex and kind of labyrinthine and unfair uh, healthcare system until yeah. she passed away. Uh -huh. um, and so I realized that just being able to create economic opportunities is incredibly important. And so um, as soon as I became able, I committed myself to finding entrepreneurs who wanted to specifically, so with Democratized Ventures, my investment thesis is that I want to create um, investments within entrepreneurs of color based on the East Coast because I want to do more than provide money. I provide advice. Uh, I'm there for them to help them think about how to build their product, how to connect with customers, how to make their product and their business sustainable, areas where I have expertise. Uh, so entrepreneurs of color on the East Coast and then products that democratize a given sector or space. So when I think about what's driven a lot of innovation, it has been... You know, the idea that it used to be only the wealthy could get access to a private vehicle. Now we all take for granted that many of us, you know, despite the fact that, you know, some of these companies aren't perfect, the technology and innovation has allowed us and many of us can now get a private car just on our phone. We can now access music and movie libraries that, you know, there were always people who had access to, but now all of us can see almost every movie ever made, every song, listen to every song ever recorded. And so I also look for ventures that are going to democratize a given space. Um, and my goal there is, yes, to find a way to create jobs and create opportunities for others to um, live their dreams, but always with an idea that, you know, I want to support building more sustainable companies. So oftentimes those investments or companies that I support will be B Corps uh, or other types of entities that are committed to social impact as part of their operations. You're doing this through salesforce.org? No, so my work with Salesforce is different. Uh, oh, so okay. my, my personal way of giving back is through democratized ventures. But okay. with Salesforce, I built a variety of different. So I worked initially as a what's called a product manager. 
Um, so a product manager is essentially like an entrepreneur within a larger organization or entity. So I, I go in, I talk to customers and I learn about issues that they're facing and I help to design a product that can use like Salesforce technology to address those issues. And for me, those issues are all in the realm of social impact. So I initially designed a platform within Salesforce called Philanthropy Cloud that launched about four years ago in partnership with United Way Worldwide. And it's an employee giving and volunteering tool uh, used by hundreds of companies now to help their employees engage with causes, whether that's sustainability, uh, human services, um, the arts. And since then I've designed a few other platforms. So I worked with uh, Sean Puffy Combs and Combs Enterprises to design a platform they recently announced earlier this year in, on the anniversary of the Tulsa massacre uh, to help entrepreneurs, uh, black entrepreneurs create a digital main street um, so that they could more easily find and engage with customers. And again, build, build communities and build wealth and increase the amount of time that uh, dollars circulate in the black community. So that app uh, is gonna be launching uh, sometime in the next six months, I believe. And it is um, gonna, it's called Shop Circulate. Uh, I have helped to uh, think about and promote our sustainability cloud. I helped to design uh, Salesforce's work.com, which was our COVID response technology that companies uh, and about half US states use to drive their reopening decisions. So we brought in uh, data on COVID spread. We created surveys and other tools that companies could use to learn how their employees were feeling. Uh, and then use all that data to decide, is it safe and advisable for us to reopen in the face of the challenges of COVID-19 or not? Uh, and that platform has evolved now into a broader well-being platform that's gonna launch uh, likely later this year. Uh, so I've been involved in building uh, several different tools, but again, all of them go back to my mission. I always like to do work um, that drives resources to people who need them. And so all of them have that as a common thread. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like that dovetails very nicely with your uh, Democratized Ventures initiative. It does. It does. Yeah. I'm able to be very familiar with the space of people trying to build things that make the world better. And that's, that's really all I care about. So your job at your work at Salesforce.org is like your day job, right? That's, that's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. Like many, uh, many other millennials, you know, you have to have the side hustle. And for me, it's, it's not only about what that does in terms of my you know, income and all of that. It's also just, you know, there's so much to be done. Um, and so I want to be a part of it in whatever way I can. So I wear a few different hats. You mentioned Democratized Ventures, uh, Salesforce. I'm also an elected official here in D.C., um, but, you know, hyper-local government, I'm an ANC. Uh, so if you're familiar with that system. Uh, so I do a lot of things, but all of it is uh, in line with my broader kind of goals and mission. Okay. Uh, you said you're a, a local public official in D.C.? That's right. D.C. has a... So first of all, for all your listeners, D.C. should be a state. Yeah. Um, but in lieu of being a state, um, it has a body that's called the Advisory Neighborhood Commission, which is established uh, some decades ago. And it essentially acts like a version of a House of Representatives if DC were to be a state. So I represent about uh, 2,500 of my uh, neighbors and um, just engage in hyper-local government. So, you know, in the past few weeks, some of those uh, accomplishments have been helping to get speed tables or speed bumps installed in some of the local streets, working to support some men in a, the Columbia Heights Plaza in a neighborhood here in DC, one of the kind of central gathering places uh, within the Columbia Heights neighborhood that I'm in. Um, they're dealing with substance abuse and they're dealing with evictions post COVID-19. So I deal with some of those issues working with local uh, elected officials as well as uh, other folks from the, uh, whether it's the police department, Department of Behavioral Health. Um, so I engage in those kinds of issues as well uh, as a volunteer. Sounds like you've got your plate full. <laughs> I stay busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like it. Uh, so I, I, I need to understand a little bit. You, you, at one point where you were on the street, just about, you were working to keep things together for your mom. You didn't have much in the way of an income. Now yeah. you're involved with philanthropy. Are you, did you, you know, come up with, a way to gain a Porsche, a personal fortune that you could use or 
How is this working? You know, one of the things, the, the main difference for me has been, and when, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book was to inspire others who may be going through similar travails. Yeah. And I would say really that, you know, I always tell people it only takes one opportunity. And so for me, I continued at some point during that, during those struggles, mm -hmm. I took a step back and asked myself what I really wanted to do and okay. why. Yeah. Um, I have been obsessed with a very specific set of careers in charity and philanthropy. And, and like I said, and like you mentioned, no one was hiring. I had no money. Um, right. I was completely destitute. At one point, you know, I think I, I ate 7-Eleven burritos um, for probably 12 straight days in a row before I was able to treat myself to a nice frozen Totino's pizza. Um, but at <laughs> some point along the line, I was able to continue to kind of map out when I connected to why I wanted to do the work I wanted to do, I realized that I didn't need to do it only within the space of charity and philanthropy, that there were other kinds of jobs, other kinds of industries that I could be in, and I began to map them out. And once I mapped out those places and those people, those conferences, those publications, I just dove in and I began to make connections. And eventually I was given a chance. Um, I ran a Gates funded initiative within an organization called Global Impact. And that pushed me into uh, an income bracket where I could begin to think about giving back. And then of course, you know, for any of your listeners who don't know, there are for all of its issues and for all of the things we need to kind of think about it on a societal level, Silicon Valley is providing some tremendous opportunities in terms of the salaries and the other benefits that they provide, whether those are stock units or uh, other kinds of compensation. And so once I was able to show that my that I had the ability to build products and tools that helped people. I found uh, in a meeting, I was presenting uh, and ran into some of the folks within salesforce.org, which uh, at the time was a separate entity actually from Salesforce, but it was the social impact center for how the company uh, wanted to both distribute grants and also it gives away lots of free technologies um, to nonprofit customers. And I was given an opportunity to join the company and that vaulted me to another level. And then, of course, uh, the book came out earlier this year, and it's been um, doing well. And just over time, it, you know, there's a funny thing when you're an entrepreneur, and they say it only takes, you know, 10, 10 years to be successful or, you know, something to that effect. Right. And so it's been about 10 years, but I am now at a level where I can angel invest, which I think more people should be able to do. Uh, we need to really think about how we can allow ordinary people to invest in small businesses in their community much more easily than we do today um, because those kinds of investments have very high returns. Um, so it's been a slow transformation. When I first moved to DC and took my first job here, I was living in a literal closet where my head touched the wall, one wall and my feet the other and everywhere I went, my shoes had holes in them. And luckily I think, uh, nobody knew that I was uh, walking around with wet socks, uh, but it's been, a, it's been a long journey. Um, but I would say it's, it's a mix of kind of fortune and the right people and the right strategies and, and really just thinking broadly about, you know, what kind of impact I want to have, what kind of work I want to do um, in a way that's, that's evolved over time. And now with the book, I'm hoping to help others with as well, however I can. Do you feel that um, there's been progress with respect to um, minority business entrepreneurs? Do you, do you see more successful? Yeah. Uh, talk about that if you can. I feel like there's been progress in, in some senses. Um, uh -huh. The demographic starting the most businesses now is African-American women uh, and women of color more broadly. So there has been some progress. But when you look at even who benefited from the, um, the, the loans that went out during COVID-19 to support small businesses, many of them weren't businesses owned by people of color. When you look at the, uh, the venture capital space or the angel investment space, not only are the, the VCs and the angels very often not people of color, but the organizations and businesses that they pour resources into are often not run by people of color or um, have no people of color even holding shares. So there has been progress, but it's been very slow and very incremental um, and a lot more needs to be done. Okay. Now, what advice do you give uh, these individuals as they embark on their journey? You know, the first advice I give to anyone is that they're not alone. 
-hmm. When I was dealing with loss, you know, my mother being ill, um, she had lupus and she hadn't actually told anyone. So she'd known, uh, I recount this in the book, but she'd known for several years that she was dying and had not told anyone in our family. And here I am again, 26, 27, dealing with my own issues of you know, not being able to, having no job, no place to live. I, you know, try to deal with all of that alone. And the advice I would give to others now is find a network, find um, others who will be willing to talk to you. I count myself in that category, uh, but as I've grown in my career, I've, I've been so pleasantly surprised at how easy it is for someone to just reach out to someone, even if it's through LinkedIn or some other channel and they've never met them. And so many people are willing to respond, to provide advice, to provide connections, to help introduce you to someone who can help you get a job or help you deal with an issue. And that's leaving aside family, who I often didn't rely on um, because in many cases I couldn't. Um, they come from a background similar to mine, so they didn't have much help to offer as well, but I was not alone. They were there for me. And so that's the first piece of advice I give. The second is, you know, I, I want to tell as many people as possible not to let their dreams go. Um, because instead of letting go, instead, I, I encourage people to strive to connect their dreams to whatever they're having to do to survive. And so I have, I have more detail in the book, but the best example I, I'll give is a, is a friend who's a bartender. He's working as a bartender to survive. Um, but he also has a dream of making jewelry um, and creating a thriving uh, business around that. And so, you know, what I would tell him is don't give up on the dream to make jewelry. Instead, be strategic and think about how you can connect that to your job as a bartender in the service industry as a means to survival. And what that means in practice is that uh, I encouraged him and helped him to find uh, bars where he can go in and say, hey, we're a little light. We don't have a lot of uh, customers on a Monday or Tuesday or Sunday. What if we did a pop-up uh, jewelry exhibition and I brought in some people and had my pieces. And in that way, he's connecting his passions, his dreams to the work he has to do simply to survive. And I think a lot of folks have figured that out, but there's a lot of room to be really strategic there in, in helping you to one, generate additional income, but find a path to just kind of pivot and connect your dreams to what you're doing to survive, not necessarily give up on them. And the third piece of advice that I give is that it really just takes one. Um, whenever you're feeling hopeless, which I is a feeling I know very well, uh, I just try to remind myself and others that it only takes one, one person to believe in you, one job offer, one opportunity, one volunteer opportunity to just show someone what you're capable of. Um, don't worry about all the times that you failed or all the times you've heard no, just worry about how you're going to get that one time that's going to change your life. So that's generally, you know, what I've been offering as advice. Um, but I think it's just important for people to know that there are resources out there and I want to be one of them. Um, if you, if any of your listeners are interested in connecting with me, I've been, you know, I wrote the book to try to help others because I thought, there were times where I almost ended my life because I thought there was no hope and I don't want anyone to go through that. You know, you, you talked about the journey and the things that you did and how you connected and one thing led to another and eventually you, you have succeeded. But you've done that in an atmosphere in this country that can be difficult for an African-American male, yeah. for an African-American, and a male yeah. to be even on top of that. So how has that affected what you've done? You know, I think it's affected, it's affected me a great deal in ways that I'm still only realizing, to be, to be honest. You know, one of the most interesting things is just what you're allowed to kind of think is possible for yourself. And so growing up in a community, I grew up in Dallas and Oak Cliff. Um, like my mom was a single mom, not a lot of means. And uh, she worked her butt off, um, but that's just the way it is. It's the world is expensive and it's hard to raise a kid. It's hard to do it on your own. And, you know, one of the things that's been very interesting to me now as I'm older and I look at younger 
uh, African Americans and especially younger Black men is just this idea that, you know, what's, what can you do? What's possible for yourself? And I remember I got to college. Now I'll, I'll just tell a quick anecdote uh, that I sometimes share, but um, I got to college, <laughs> have a lot of student loan debt, um, but I got, a scho- I got some scholarships. Uh, I went to the University of Pittsburgh's Bradford campus. And um, at one point I got an additional scholarship to do some study abroad. So I went on a program called Semester at Sea. And it's a program that takes people, it's still available all over the world. So we went to 12 different countries on a ship. You spend about you know, a few days to a week to a little over a week perhaps in each port. And at one point I'm in Hong Kong and I'm walking around. I'd never even seen the ocean before I got on this ship. <laughs> um, and so I'm walking around Hong Kong and at one point I stop and I sit in a, a Kowloon Park um, and um, two, African American, two African gentlemen come up to me and I feel this, I felt this uh, fear rising in my heart. You know, I'm the only, me and these two guys are the only, uh, you know, people with dark skin in this entire park. And I, 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 I realized, you know, why am I scared? Why am I afraid of these gentlemen? And they come up and they're just asking me whether I know kind of where, what's a fun place to hang out. Of course I didn't. We had a very lovely normal conversation for a few minutes. About an hour later, I'm walking around the city and I notice I'm being followed. Um, there's a gentleman who follows me for probably a mile or two, perhaps longer. And finally, I turned around and said, I think you're following me. Why are you following me? And he says to me, uh, you know, I think you seem American. You, you're, you're black. Uh, you, you all are very wealthy, right? So I, I was thinking you might want to come by my tailor shop. Uh, of course, I'm a completely destitute student. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Those kinds of experiences made me realize how much in this country just the perception that others have of me my worth their expectations of you know what kinds of careers I'm going to to be in what kinds of worth I can bring to a job um you know that I might be frightening if I make the wrong move as I've grown older I realize how much pressure that puts on people and how much it can help just to see that there's more possibilities for you beyond what society thinks is right for you. And that's been one of the most profound realizations for me. Um, Now being able to walk into a room and I'm not a black, always a black guy, but I'm an investor. Mm -hmm. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a technologist. I'm an elected official. I'm an author. And being able to go into a room and share those possibilities with young people of color is something that I'm very passionate about for that reason, but also just being able to go in and kind of smash those stereotypes in the face, <laughs> not to, <laughs> not to um, but it not only feels good on a personal level, but um, it's my, one of the ways that I hope to, along with many, many others who are fighting the same battle kind of every day, um, one of the ways I hope to change perceptions. Um, and I think a lot of that is happening, but there's so much further to go. And I think what's really interesting now is all of that, the change that we have seen is facing such a big backlash, I think. I don't really know any other way to describe it. Do you feel like racism in this country has worsened or improved in the past few years? I believe that it's worsened. And I like to think of it in a statistical sense. I don't think that there are more racist people. Um, I think instead that the people who are have been empowered over the past, especially since 2016. And I I remember I had a conversation with a friend just after the Trump election where I said, of course, this is all just my personal opinion, but my my belief at that time was I'm not really worried about Trump. He seems like a dummy. Like, I don't think he's going to be able to manage a good good system. And he, he wasn't. He's a bad manager. He manage the country almost like his businesses, firing people left and right. Of course, you're not going to get a lot of work done. But what was terrifying about him was in his quest to seek attention, he was kicking over all kinds of rocks. And it was the the people that were scurrying out from underneath them that were feeling empowered for the first time, almost in a generation or more. That's what is, that's what's scary. They have a voice that they feel they haven't had in a long time. They have, The means, uh, especially through a lot of irresponsible technologies that have been created, like Facebook, 
to get their message out to more people who were always there and always believed it, but now know more than ever that they're not alone. Yeah. That to me is what's grown. And so when you think about it I, from the perspective of the percentage of the population, I do not necessarily think the country is more racist. I think that we have the capability and the number of people that it takes who are willing to help solve problems and create a more equitable society. And I think that's most people. But I think the, in terms of percentage of the dialogue, percentage of the overall emotional tenor of so many of the conversations that we see around us and that are driving and impacting policy uh, and people's decision-making and how people treat each other, I think that is more racist in some ways than perhaps since the 60s. Um, and that, it, it, it's, it's, it's scary. Uh, and I even see some of that at the local level here in DC, where I see, and this ties into my earlier comment of, I see some of my neighbors feeling that, you know, there's some, oh, there's these people, you know, and I'll just use the code word, right? There's these people hanging out in front of this house. Maybe mm -hmm. they're dealing drugs. They're not dealing drugs. Mm -hmm. They're just here in front of their house. They live here. They are allowed to hang out in front of their house. Yeah. And yet you have voices that kind of don't want to see some of those issues. So yeah. um, it's a hard question to answer. And Lord knows, I, I no one, probably no one has the answer, but that's been my take and my fear, but I have a lot of hope as well through some of the work that I do that we can create more empathy, that we can use technology to do good rather than just create division. Um, so that's what I try to keep my mind on and work toward. Okay. Randall, is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience? No, I would say, you know, just recalling that advice, you know, of, of, of everything I said, just for folks to remember that they're not alone. And you know, it's, these are very difficult times that we're living in, but we also have such an incredible opportunity, every single one of us, to reshape the way the world works. Let's all make sure that, because that reshaping, that reformulation of our society is happening. We all need to speak up to make sure that it happens strategically and with intention in a way that helps all of us and not just the few. Um, whether that's redefining the future of work so that we can have people who live in rural areas or inner cities not having to go off to San Francisco to do unpaid internships and wander the streets. They can find remote work that pays incredibly well from Kansas City or wherever they might be. We have the opportunity with all of these struggles to redefine so much of the world and how it operates. And it includes ESG or the movement around environmental social governance. We have to make that real, not just a set of accounting standards that companies kind of use and fudge to say, oh, we're like planting all these trees and we're, we're doing these volunteer hours. No, there has to be real impact that's happening. And we can enforce that through policy and regulation if we make our voices heard. And so I would just say that you're not alone if you're out there thinking the world can be better. I'm thinking it too and working towards it and you can as well, no matter what your role is, no matter what your job is, all of the things that you associate with philanthropy and social impact don't belong to the rich. They don't belong to the wealthy. They belong to every single one of us. And now is actually the time. It's, there's, it's prime time to see whether we can change these systems and actually make things better. And so I'm excited to go on that journey with folks like yourself and any of your listeners. Um, and we'll kind of see what happens, but you know, that's my message. Um, philanthropy belongs to everyone and impact that can happen anywhere, no matter what job you're doing or who you are. Okay. Uh, how can people reach you and where can they find your book? So you can find my book at uh, Dreams Deferred, um, Recession, Struggle and the Quest for a Better World on uh, Amazon or other major retailers. Um, you can connect with me at Brandel and B on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, or Instagram, there's not a lot of Brandolins out there. So once you find me once, it's pretty easy to find me a hundred other times. Um, but I'm also happy to speak with folks. I'm doing a radio tour. I'm speaking at events, trying to bring hope uh, to whoever uh, wants it. And um, I'm here if needed.